Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right, everyone, you're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy and my co-host, Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? Just finished the Elon Musk biography. I'm ready to drive an electric car, go to Mars, get a chip implant, and then dig a tunnel. So a lot <laughs> happening this week. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's jump into it. We'll uh, we'll talk about everyone's favorite topic, uh, taxes in particular, capital gains, how they're treated, strategies around it, et cetera. And then we'll end with our something or nothing segment. We got a couple of great articles uh, we we saw that we want to talk about and discuss. So let's talk about the capital gains. Yeah, yeah. let's kick off. So Tom, um, we can ask, we can answer, however you want to do this, but I'll kick it off easily with you. Just what is capital gains tax and how does it work? Yeah, so the easiest way to think about capital gains tax is, and these are for after-tax accounts. It doesn't, it's not as applicable to your qualified accounts, IRAs, 401ks, but if you have an after-tax account, a brokerage account, whatever it may be, um, it doesn't just apply to investments, it applies to other things, but we'll, we'll look at it through the lens of investments. If you buy stock for $100 and you sell that stock for 150, you have what's called the capital gains of $50. Depending on how long you held that stock, if it was less than a year, you are going to owe ordinary income tax on that $50 gain. If you hold it for one year and one day, you're going to be treated at the capital gains rate, which is goes up to 20% depending on your tax bracket. So in Big picture, that's that's how capital gains work. But one big misconception that, that I hear from my clients a lot, it's not a capital gain until you sell it. So I was going to ask that clarifying question. I'll play a uh, client for a second. So, Tom, we had an awesome year last year. Market was up over 20 percent. My account's way up. How much am I going to have to pay in taxes? Yeah, and that really comes down to if we sold anything. Because um, at the end of the day, an unrealized capital gains tax is what is referred to is only a paper loss or gain. So you don't realize that tax gain or loss until, until you sell that security. That's right. So there was a bill a few years ago that proposed to tax unrealized gains, especially on they called millionaires and billionaires. Bernie Sanders and um, Elizabeth Warren were hot to try on this idea. It did not pass. It seems really difficult to pass. And then we had a following year where the market fell and some of those tech companies fell by half. You go, well, are you going to give them an unrealized loss? And then they can carry that forward forever. So nothing happened there. So today the rules are pretty straightforward. You pay it as a tax on investments, hold it for more than a year. You get a long-term gain, shorter, ordinary income. So depending on your tax rate, uh, it can actually determine your capital gains rate. So if you make little to no money taxable income at all, your capital gains rate could be 0%. For the majority of Americans, 15% is going to be your capital gains rate. And for our highest earners, uh, it jumps to 20%. And then there's a thing they call the Medicare surcharge, which is the net investment income tax, which can be a 3.8% on top of that that goes towards paying for Medicare uh, if you're in one of those higher tax brackets. And they define higher tax bracket for a married finally jointly just above 200000 yeah, so it's and you know I want to I want to clarify one thing too. So capital gains tax is the buying and selling of, of securities having a gain or loss. That's treated very differently from income. So for those of you that have income producing, whether it's stocks, bonds, municipals, whatever it may be, money markets. Um, a lot of individuals were in money markets last year, and while while you were getting you know five maybe five and a half percent, which sounds great that income is taxed at ordinary income. And we can get into offsetting capital gains tax in, in a second, but you know the income derived from the securities um, is gonna be taxed at either ordinary income, and those are typically bonds, money markets, um, or capital gains tax, which are uh, dividends coming from stocks. Um, and then you have municipal bond funds, which are tax-free. So those are treated completely separate. And I say separate because one of the strategies that we use for after-tax accounts is we do what's called tax loss harvesting. So if towards the end of the year, if we have a 
a, a net capital gains tax because we sold some securities that were up, we can go in there and we can sell some stocks or some securities that were down and that will offset dollar for dollar those gains depending on how much uh, the gains or losses were. But the income derived from those securities is completely different and you can't offset that with buying and selling. Yeah, to that end, the other thing you can do is you can offset some of that ordinary income up to a $3,000 limit per year uh, against capital gains. Anything in excess of that can be carried forward until you exhaust it. So there's no timeline. You could have $100,000 in losses this year, or maybe if you were strategic in 2022 and you took some big capital losses uh, and maybe flipped from one small cap fund into maybe a mid cap value or something that made it different. So you could have active management for passive management, capture that tax loss, and then reinvest that money you might have an opportunity to not pay any taxes going forward, which can be tremendously helpful in reducing or avoiding capital gains. Um, yeah. Just to put it in uh, an example, so let's say you buy an investment, let's say just general stock market fund for $10,000, they always use that in those examples, and it rises to 20,000. You don't owe anything until you sell it. So at that moment, you have an unrealized gain of $10,000. Now, if you were to sell it before the one year mark, that $10,000 gain is subject to short-term capital gains tax at your ordinary income rate. So if your marginal tax bracket is 22%, that's what you'd owe on that $10,000 gain. However, if you waited a year and you had it subject to long-term capital gains, in most cases, it's only gonna be 15%. So you get to have 7% less on your taxes that you pay on that investment. So it is powerful to wait longer. Uh, Tom, any other ways you can reduce or minimize your tax rate or capital gains tax owed? Yeah, so I, I would say that the tax loss harvesting, um, we do a lot of that throughout the whole year. You mentioned 2022, there was a lot of volatility in the market. It was a it was a down year, and we were selling a lot of securities. And then the big question is, well, you don't sell when securities are down. You wanna you wanna buy when they're down. Well, one strategy for tax loss harvesting is something called a wash sale. So if you were to sell a stock that was down to realize that uh, that loss. You have to wait 30 days to buy that stock back. But one strategy we use is if you have a stock, let's say it's Exxon, um, we wanted to sell it to lock in that loss. You can buy a comparable stock like Chevron or something in that in that industry. You could buy an ETF. So there's ways where you actually don't even have to wait the 30 days. Now, you're not going to buy the same security, but it's a way that if you don't want to wait the 30 days to lock in that loss, move to something else that's going to be very similar same sector and you can do it with ETFs, you can do it with mutual funds. Um, so it's a way to lock in as many losses as you can, because to your point, Kevin, you can carry those forward for as long as you want, because eventually you're going to have gains in the market. You know, we don't like, you know, what we say is we don't let the, the tax tail wag the dog. We're not going to just <laughs> not sell something because we're going to generate a capital gains. If we had a good run up in an investment, we want to lock in that game because, well, it's a paper gain or paper loss. So. There's a balancing act and we spend a lot of time throughout the year because at the end of the day, it's all about net net return. What are you going to take home after taxes? And that's a great way tax loss harvesting to do throughout the year to make sure that at the end of the year, you're not going to have a tax bill and anything you're going to have a carry forward for, for the following year. Yeah. So I'd like to hit on two ways you can avoid capital gains tax entirely, and then we'll move on to our next segment. Um, the first way you can avoid it completely is by not selling. So if you never sell it and you hold it forever, then you won't have to pay any capital gains tax. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, what you can do is maybe you leave something to your kids. You can have an appreciated asset that you give to the next generation. They receive a stepped up cost basis at death. So let's say you were somebody who bought Apple stock at any point really in the last 20 years, and now it's gone 10X or 12X. It's just continued to rise and it makes up a huge part of your portfolio. And you don't want to sell it because 90% of that gain is going to be taxed and so you have let's say a hundred thousand dollars but only 10 of it is you know 10 percent is a uh, principal or basis if you waited and just when you pass you pass that asset on to the kids their stepped up cost basis is at the fair market value of whatever on the date of death or six months later so uh there's kind of two choices you can elect for that but really it's an opportunity to then inherit a hundred thousand dollars of apple stock at a cost basis of 100 with the fair market value at 100,000 as well, you can avoid paying capital gains tax entirely. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback off of that too, because sometimes it, it, you know, you have this stock, let's say you own Chevron. Well, Chevron pays a dividend. So if you're reinvesting that dividend, even though you never sold Chevron stock and it could be up, you're gonna owe the capital gains tax uh, 
which is the long-term capital gains tax on that dividend that you're reinvesting. You're gonna owe that every year on your tax return. So some of these investments do pay interest, do pay dividends. You will be responsible for paying that tax. But yeah, if you buy a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, you hold on to it, you're never gonna to have to pay capital gains tax and you can, it's a great wealth transfer tool and estate planning tool to your point with this. Yeah, dollars. those qualified dividends are taxed at the capital gains rate, which is helpful too, as opposed to being ordinary income like interest from bonds or interest from your savings account. And the last piece, Tom, I would just say, what about if you just give it away? <laughs> Let's talk about giving away the appreciated assets to a charity. Um, so you can really give away anything, you can give away stocks, bonds, artwork, real estate, um, uh, a gun collection, a toy collection, um, some other assets that we usually don't discuss, uh, and we'll call them digital assets. Those things can be given away to a qualified charity uh, and they're subject to limits. So Usually it can be either 30% or 50% of your adjusted gross income, depending on the type of charity you give to, or maybe you're using a donor advised fund. So there are limits to this. You can again, carry forward those excess gifts that you make to future years and use them. They don't have to go away, uh, much like the capital gains loss that you could carry forward, um, but that's a way you can avoid it entirely. So the key thing is if you bought, let's say just a broad stock market fund, you held it for more than one year and it appreciated, maybe it doubled in value, it was a really great year, and you give it away to an eligible charity, you can avoid the capital gains tax entirely. Um, if you do it prior to that one year, a portion of that, your principal would be eligible to be given away. Um, the rest of it, you wouldn't have to pay taxes on, but you wouldn't get to deduct that gift. Uh, so there is a difference between short and long term when you're giving to charity as well. You know, there's there's also a we'll land on this strategy, which we don't talk a whole lot about, and many people don't even know it's available. But we have a lot of clients that are C-suite executives at companies, and they have a lot, a lot of company stock. And when they go to retire, it can make up more than half of their total net worth in this company stock. And if they go to sell that, um, there's going to be a, a massive tax burden on that on that sale. So there's something called an exchange fund. It's not an exchange traded fund. It's not an ETF. It's called an exchange fund where you can diversify that concentrated stock position into this fund, you won't pay taxes on it, and then you can invest in multiple different investments. So all you're doing is deferring that tax, but you're not holding on to just one stock. You're diversifying through multiple different stock positions in that exchange fund. Um, you will eventually have to pay tax. It's not a way around it. It's just a way not to pay the tax right now and to also diversify if you just have one concentrated stock position. It's not, not as frequent, it's a little bit more rare, but that is a strategy out there. And there's others too, which we won't get in onto this pod, but if, if you have questions around taxes, um, we work directly with, with your CPAs, other CPAs, and we can help you out with, with strategies on that. All right, great. Well, thanks, Tom. Let's move on to something or nothing. is our game about recent headlines so all right well um, I'll, I'll i'll kick it off and i'll give this first one to you because you got so excited about elon musk i am excited about it debacle he's been all over twitter or x about this delaware uh llc or i don't even know what kind of corporation he filed there but moving out of delaware because of the massive uh, hit he's about to take redomiciling is what they call it so he got denied what would have added up to 55 billion dollars um, which, you know, we'll pause for a minute to let that have effect because it is a tremendous amount of money. And I think that payday alone would have put him as one of the richest men in the world, if not the richest, just that alone. So the fact that a judge can deny somebody $55 billion is incredible. But if we go into the details here, what happens is most companies, especially the publicly traded ones, are incorporated in Delaware. Uh, Delaware has a long history of being, we'll call it business friendly. They have something called a chancery court which is something that they call a court of equity. Uh, so instead of a jury or something like that, you have a judge who's qualified in business law who then evaluates the case and will make a ruling. Uh, typically, it's been in the, fair, uh, the shareholder's best interest or the corporation's best interest to incorporate in Delaware. Uh, Elon Musk is trying to turn that on its head this week uh, after he got denied. So uh, this has been covered extensively in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, uh, the All In podcast, which some of his buds are on. Uh, but Essentially what happened is one shareholder who owned nine shares filed a lawsuit saying that the compensation was you know, ridiculous and he shouldn't be awarded all this money. Uh, what happened was is Elon Musk took no salary, no stock-based compensation, no incentive options, nothing like that uh, when all the work he was doing for the past years uh, at Tesla. Instead, it was all incentive-based. So he had to hit massive goals. And so these were revenue goals, they were profitability goals, it was number of vehicles um, being delivered. 
a really hard thing to manipulate. Uh, you can't just ride on uh, the market went up and hey, I did well because my company is a publicly traded market. Um, he hit numbers that were incredible. So he went more than 10x on revenue. They went from delivering you know tens of cars to hundreds of thousands of cars. Uh, and because of that, the stock price zoomed up higher and be, hit these certain thresholds. He was awarded you know 1% of the company in stock and he got all these other compensation benefits after not taking even a dollar of salary, anything like that along the way. And the judge said, no, we're, we're not gonna do that after this lawsuit was filed. So Musk has said, I think we're gonna move to Texas. He put a poll on Twitter thinking that maybe he can get enough kind of the groundswell to go. And I think that there's just a lot here to discuss about whether or not Delaware is the future. But more importantly, when you have a CEO that hits these massive goals, if you're gonna deny him compensation after the fact, I don't know why anybody would go for massive goals. I don't know how this is going to help anybody going forward. Yeah, you know, um, it, it's something I'm guessing your take is it's something I, I, I agree with you. And, and by the oh, way, yeah. in 2018, <laughs> when this whole thing was decided on the board of directors who they're claiming he was just too close to and they were his buddies, the stock's up almost 800 <laughs> percent since since uh, this whole thing went into play with this whole compensation package. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's something and um, it's kind of scary how they can just say, oh, no, you know what? You didn't follow the right procedures. It, 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 the, the stock was mispriced and unfairly priced and the compensation was unfairly priced. It's a publicly traded company. They had a board of directors to vote on it and he's done really well by the shareholders. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, to your I, point, I mean, compared to some of the other car companies, some of their CEOs of the same time period have made in excess of $100 million. I would say the Tesla has been the most successful car company the last five or 10 years for sure. Uh, and definitely as far as stocks go, been the most rewarding one to own. Yep, I agree. All right, Tom, I'm going to ask you something or nothing. So there's a shipping company out of Denmark named Maersk. It suspended their dividend recently. Uh, and the CEO was cited as saying, this is just a difficult patch for the business. I also looked up the Baltic dry index and we've seen that drop lately is shipping dead is the baltic index a leading indicator we should pay attention to ultimately is this something or is this nothing i i think it's nothing um yeah they are one of the biggest shippers out there um shipping is not going away anytime soon i think there was you had the huge bottleneck of covid and the ramp up um revenues ramped up and now instead of doing stock buybacks which they just discontinued as as well which was 1.6 billion they, they they suspended the dividends and i think you're going to see that with with a lot of companies and they just laid off 10,000 people and these are just measures you take when cash flow goes from you know an excess of you know 500 million to net negative you have to take those measures you know when you have excess cash flow you reinvest you do stock buybacks or you issue dividends um so this is just one tool in any company's bag to to halt the dividend, stop the st stock buybacks, and get things back to where they need to be. So I think they're being prudent in taking this, in taking this move. Um, I, I I think you're gonna. I think this is a natural cyclical uh, environment for type of businesses. Um, they ebb and flow, and you see this all the time with with stock with uh, companies uh, halting their dividends or cutting their dividends, and then eventually increasing them. So I, I think it's nothing. Yeah, the only the only thing I would say is I, I think we'll know whether it was something or nothing six months from now, because it could be something that signals that global trade is about to drop and they kind of see it coming because their order book is light. Uh, mm -hmm. Or it could be like you said, is they overbuilt during the stuff right after COVID where shipping was going nuts and inflation was going crazy. And they said, we can't get enough ships out there going places because demand was so high. Uh, that's a simple business thing. And they go, oops, we went too far. Now we're cutting back. Uh, yep. So we'll find out later. I agree. All right. Is this something or nothing? Uh, Cobold, is that how you pronounce it? Um, yeah, the, sure. The, the I've startup. only read it. I've never heard anybody talk about it. So Yeah, well, it, I haven't heard it either. And this was a, a startup that's actually backed by both Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. Um, Isn't that wild? <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. And they just found a ridiculous uh, copper deposit in uh, just north of the Congo. So something or nothing. Uh, I think this is something. So we talked about crypto previously, and I just complained, like, where's the results? Where's all the promise? And I said, wait till AI does something cool. I think that's got a lot of potential. This is the first thing besides a chatbot that I thought, wow, this is really powerful stuff. So what they did is they built a computer to scan all old maps, tapestries, any data they could find. They plugged into this computer and let the AI 
through machine learning or something else that we don't understand yet, go through and basically look at it. So they piggybacked on work from the last 100, 200 years of people going and drilling, finding dry holes, uh, not finding copper, anything like that. And they plugged all that big data unstructured into a computer and the computer said, go dig here. And they went over there and they found one of the largest vast copper deposits they found ever in Zambia. And so it's something that I think is going to be tremendous. Uh, we talked last year, I think it was that Zambia had some corporate or sorry, some sovereign debt problems. So this will help them solve that as well. But I think things like this, where you're going to take old maps from the 1600s, 1700s, whether it's looking in the oceans for treasure or it's looking for copper deposits in the, you know, nowhere in Africa, people have been looking for this stuff for hundreds of years. So I think this is kind of the low hanging fruit is let's look at the previous generations. Let's piggyback on their data that would otherwise be lost to history and go find this stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think it's something as well. I mean, it's so interesting, this this whole article uh, on, on how they found it. I mean, it's going to hopefully lower cost across the board. I mean, we talked about Dr. Copper. Copper is so applicable in everyday lives, and especially as it, you know, we're going towards more of this green transition, electric driving vehicles. Um, so the copper and lithium that they found, um, I think, is going to be something. All right, Tom, let's switch over to hyperinflation. A couple of years ago, we spent a lot of pods talking about inflation. And could it go to hyperinflation? Well, there is one country where, besides Argentina, that's a major problem. Turkey uh, recently raised rates to 64, sorry, raised rates because of a 64% inflation rate in December. Their central bank is targeting an eye popping 36% inflation rate for 2024. Um, could this happen in the US? Could rates in the US spike from inflation? Could they go to the teens and further? Could we be Turkey next? Yeah, I think this is this is definitely something for Turkey, but it's nothing for the rest <laughs> of the world. I mean, we've seen hyperinflation. I mean, Venezuela, Russia. I mean, there's a thousand other countries that have been in just as bad shape. And you look at Turkey. I mean, their growth was just unsustainable. So they had massive, massive imports, no exports, running a huge surplus, and then. What they did wrong and where it turned was they did not raise rates. When they when the first hit of inflation came around, they kept rates low, which as dumb as our central bankers are, they at least had the foresight to increase rates. Um, we'll see if this ends up being the right decision or not. But Turkey didn't do anything. So what happened was you had you had the you had the 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 currency just get devaluated. You know, at in two thousand eight, the lira was almost in parity with the dollar. It's now worth four cents. So the currency is practically worthless. People's wages aren't going up. Um, inflation, to your point, was at 85% last August. It's now down to 64, so a big drop. But it's just, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna kill the economy if it already hasn't. Um, and it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to get out of. But I don't think this is gonna, this is gonna, you know. Go, map over to the rest of the rest of the world and to the other central banks. I think this is just uh, an isolated issue within Turkey, and you could see others that pop up just like them. But um, I don't think this is going to happen in the U.S. You know, they they got a hold on it. You know, inflation's going the right way. Um, same with interest rates. So, you know, they have a they they went their interest rates were seven percent. They raised them to twenty five percent. So they're you know they're a day late and a dollar short. So it, I think it's going to take some time for them to. to to you know, iron this out, if you will. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I'd add to that, I think your takes are right on the money for it definitely matters for Turkey, maybe not so much for the rest of us, is the kind of why of behind it. So they had an inflation problem, um, but they also had an election coming up. And so the guy who runs that country made it very clear to the central bankers not to raise rates until after his election happened. And as soon as he got elected, you saw those rates go from you know very low to very high. And I think you could see something here as well, where I think the, the Federal Reserve here is independent and they've kind of maintained that. And I think they've acted somewhat like that. But you saw some of the jobs numbers in the United States are being pumped up by government jobs, not by private sector. You see the Jerome Powell doesn't really want to be involved in the election. So I think that on the fiscal side, you could see a lot of efforts by the executive branch for an election. You could even see it from congressionals who don't want to get kicked out regardless of their party. Uh, and I think that you could tip back into a higher inflation rate here through government spending that causes just more money in the economy. And I think maybe not teens or something further, but you could see a reacceleration of inflation simply from government spending to try to win an election. Uh, and I think that's what happened in Turkey, obviously an extreme example, um, but it could happen here as well. Yep, yep, I agree. All right, last one, something or nothing, the CAPE ratio, uh, originally designed by Robert Schiller. So 
it's flashing red um, at 33 times trailing earnings. Uh, is this something or nothing? I'm going to say this is nothing. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, first, it looks at trailing earnings for the last you know, 10 years. But well, we had a year in there where earnings were particularly bad called 2020. We basically stopped the economy. So I think this number might be artificially high. Uh, I do think that there's certain pockets of the market that maybe are a little excessive. But if you look at a company, some of the big tech ones, which I'm not going to name an individual, and you look at something called the peg ratio, which is their price to earnings divided by their growth rate. They're actually not that crazy. Most of them are below a two. And so I think you'd have to see that. Um, but this is one that I take a huge risk of saying it's nothing and end up on freezing cold takes a year from now. <laughs> so yeah. I'm hesitant. I'm afraid of it, but I'm going to say it's nothing. Well, Jeremy Siegel, uh, the professor at the really renowned professor at the Warren School of Business, put out a paper in 2016 stating that it's just it's overly pessimistic because a lot of the gap accounting procedures have changed um, since that time. And, you know, looking at this ratio, there's actually only been three times that this ratio was above 30. Uh, one was 2018, the other two was 2019-29. But I, I, I agree with you. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's something. Um, it, to your point, it goes back 10 years. It just for inflation for those cyclical companies like commodities and financials. Um, I don't think this is forward looking, but by any means. Yeah, the only action I would say if you're going to take any action is just be a little more cautious than you usually be. And also point out that that CAPE ratio applies to U.S. stocks, not globally. So there are some deals beyond our borders that it might make sense to say, well, maybe 5% of my allocations should be not here because this number is large. I don't think there's any opportunity to create a rule based on CAPE ratio because it hasn't been that reliable. But I am a little afraid of a flashing red. And when you bring out years like 2000 and 1929, that definitely sends off alarm bells. Yeah, but 2018 gives me some 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 peace. Um, and looking at the actual forward-looking PE ratio, I mean, we are high. So I do think valuations are stretched. Um, we're seeing that today in the market, uh, this little bit of a pullback. But uh, yeah, I don't think we should put too much emphasis and focus on the CAPE ratio. Yeah, I don't think PE is the best predictor anyway. So, um, well, Tom, it's been great. Enjoyed something for nothing. Any Any parting shots, any parting comments? Nope. Uh, we'll, we'll kick it back off in two weeks with, with some more uh, timely topics. All right. Thanks, Tom. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to GWAdvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.